On this week's episode of the Vero Beach Social Media Pop-Up Podcast, we chat with John Loomer. I like to call John the godfather of Facebook advertising. We discuss the value of Facebook ads, transitioning to other platforms, and we even dive a little into professional sports. Give it a listen. You're going to love it. I guarantee it. Here we go. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Vero Beach Social Media Pop-Up Podcast. Um, I'm super excited for this one. I'm here with John Loomer. I call him the godfather of Facebook advertising. (laughs) Um, (laughs) How are you doing today, man? Nah, I'm good. How you doing, Curtis? Great, great, great. So um, we're going to jump right into this thing. Again, I could probably talk to you for 100 hours about this, but we have to mm-hmm. limit this to one. Um, the first question I'm going to ask you, like I said, I call you the godfather of Facebook advertising. How long have you been doing this? Well, so my business is uh, over 11 years old now. So in fr- pretty early on, the focus was Facebook marketing, at least. I've t- Kind of the... The cutoff point is when uh, uh, Facebook timeline for pages was announced. So I think that was the end end of February of 2012. I wrote a whole bunch of blog posts. It was it was about four months in uh, from when I started my website at that point, and I started having more of a focus on Facebook marketing. And then probably by the the end of that year, it's been almost exclusively Facebook ads education is what I've focused on. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I, and I know a little bit about your background, but I want you to share it with the listeners. Yeah. What were you doing before uh, you were doing Facebook ads? Uh, potpourri, man. Uh, <laughs> well, first of all, if we go way back, I think it's I think it's important. Everybody does something at some point that they don't enjoy, that they know is not for them. OK, <laughs> so straight out of. So my wife and I got married. Uh, we moved to Denver and I took the first job I could get. Um, that was, I was an insurance, I was an insurance. So I was an insurance underwriter for much of that time for about five years. And the funny thing happens when you have a job you don't like, uh, that doesn't inspire you is you end up taking a lot of that energy and pushing it elsewhere. So I was, I would, I would fully admit I was not a good employee, uh, in the insurance days, spent a lot of times managing my fantasy teams. Uh, but, and this doesn't work for everybody, but it paid off. Uh, I ended up uh, writing for a number of sites for uh, fantasy games uh, way back. You know, we're talking about 1999, 2000 ish. <laughs> I actually that is back. In, my... I mean, that's before the computer was doing the stats for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not go that far. <laughs> so it, it was new, though. It was fresh. It was fresh. Um, but I, I mean, I even started my own site when that was considered like a big deal, right? Um, and then. Uh, not not to get way off track, but it, that that period of time was interrupted. In fact, my my oldest son, who was two and a half at the time, was diagnosed with cancer. So I got out of that stuff temporarily for like a year um, or about that, maybe a little bit less than that. And then I got this call or, not, or email, I guess, if I was interested in overseeing fantasy games for the NBA. OK, and that's like, what? <laughs> Uh, and I even remember my wife was out of town at the time. And, uh, uh so I was, I was like, so I, I applied for it without even telling her. Cause I was like, I'm not gonna get this stupid job, whatever. Right. Uh, it's the most amazing thing ever. Right. And, right. I, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it, it just kept, kept escalating. I called out for interviews and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh man, I'm, I gotta get this now. So I went from doing stuff that I really didn't like to sitting in an office overseeing fantasy games for the NBA. But we had to move the family and you know that's why i was relevant my you know my son it was uh, a year since diagnosis we had to switch doctors and all that stuff and move across country not to cut you and off were you working in yeah. new york so it was a combination it was secaucus uh which is where their entertainment building is okay uh, or they had two of them two entertainment buildings and then um i would occasionally go into manhattan yeah okay so um so was- this is way off topic do you know danny Maisai? Oh man, yeah, yeah, that name that name definitely sounds Yeah, he was a VP familiar. for the NBA. My neighbor used to babysit his kids. So like talk communica- about a small world. Communications or yeah, well, yep. yeah. yeah, he did all the stuff right. with TNT and, and and all those guys. But uh, anyway, but way off topic. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, well, that's funny. Um, He's been so, in my yeah, house. We watched March Madness at my house last year. <laughs> yeah, no, like we didn't know each other. I don't know if he if he'd recognize my name or not. Um, right. But uh, I definitely recognize his, his name. Right. Um, so anyway, this it was like a dream, but at the same time, you know. It was 
a bit of bartering with my wife to even move across country to do this uh because yeah like, that would take some family, uh, convincing on my end for my wife oh, <laughs> it wasn't easy you know all of her family was in colorado um you know we didn't really know anybody out in new jersey it, it's just a completely different lifestyle of course um it's just so you know stressful and hectic and everything else expensive and uh but it was also amazing I mean, we we loved it it, it was I, i'm glad we were exposed to just that different life and and just everything um unfortunately it was also during a period of time where working from home really wasn't a thing so you know i was begging them like every year like could you let me work from, you know remotely could because we we got to move you know we're gonna, we're gonna have to move back um and it just wasn't a thing so after three seasons moved back to colorado uh you know i ended up worked for a, a startup uh, fantasy games de- oh, by the way startups holy cow in, in uh, uh, development it's that is like the most stressful thing I've ever done in my life that that's six months and then I got laid off uh, <laughs> so I got laid off uh, ended up doing some like consulting stuff I guess uh, worked for American Cancer Society oh wow uh, for a little I was VP of strategic marketing for Great West division and oh and, and the NBA stuff first of all was the first time I was exposed to Facebook. So it's 2007 where we partnered with Facebook to build an app for us. Um, and that was 2007 was right. That was right when it opened up to the old folks. So I think the partnership happened like as that was going on, I was about to open up. So everyone who was in high school or college, I, I put myself in the old folks group. And uh, so I kind of fell in love with the, the platform, but you know, immediately also learned some was using it for business purposes. So I ended up getting VP of strategic marketing, which honestly was funny. Is it kind of an inside joke for me at the time? Because like uh, my old boss at the NBA, after I'd been laid off, you know, sent me this job. I'm saying hey, you might be interested in this. I'm like, how am I qualified for this? I don't even know. What, I don't know anything about marketing. But the funny thing is, at the NBA, like I didn't realize that I was doing everything there because overseeing fancy games it was marketing it was it was advertising it was um content it was de- uh, development you know getting games developed all that kind of stuff so i was like okay i'll apply it then so i got that um but that also allowed me to you know that then it's it's social media it's blogging it's websites it's kind of understanding all that technology in the, those early days which proved really helpful. So once I got laid off again for the second time in two and a half years, um, I knew I didn't want to move the family. Um, I had been working from home all this time since I left the NBA. And, uh, you know, so I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I started a website. And since that's something I kind of learned, you know, during those last few years and just started writing, didn't really know if I didn't think I started a business. I didn't know how to start a business. I had no (laughs) clue. Um, but I just, you know, had a lot of time in my hands and just, you know, just try to stay busy. And eventually, you know, that morphed into, you know, what this became, it, it became a business because I, like, I realized, oh my God, I got all this traffic. I can do something with it. Um, and yeah, here we are 11 years. Yeah. Later. That's quite a story. <laughs> kind of been everywhere <laughs> and anywhere. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm going to jump timelines back and forth, almost like a Tarantino movie yeah. here. So, so we got your background. You did Facebook for 11 years or so. Um, now we're starting to see you. Is this a transition into TikTok? Have oh, you been yeah. on it? What are we doing with TikTok now? This is absolutely a transition for me. So, um, it's, you know, it's a weird place I'm in that's unique to it, if you've been in business for a long time, especially in this industry, you know, in technology, um, well, yeah, I, I was not prepared for this. So basically like for most business and maybe I'm like, I don't know how to start a business. So I, I'm probably completely way off on this, but you start a business. <laughs> I spent so many of those first five, six years trying to find the right processes, the right software, the right uh, routine, you know, where should I be? How should I create content? You know, what, what, you know, what drives my revenue and all that kind of stuff, finding a good, you know, uh, business model. And then I found it and I'm like, okay, 
now I'm good. I, I could just ride the wave, don't need to change anything, you know, not quite that extreme, but you know, I, and I, I was just trying to work less and less every year. My kids were growing up, uh, so I have three boys. Um, I was also a baseball coach for all three and the older they got, and not, not all at once, but the older they got, the more intense that got and the more time consuming it got, which it was awesome. I loved coaching, but it just meant, you know, if originally I was doing public speaking, I was guest on everybody's podcast, I was doing all kinds of stuff, but now I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on, you know, uh, watch my kids grow, participate in their lives. Work's going to be secondary. And I know it's, it's still going to do its thing. Cause it's, you know, I set this up right. And uh, over, over the years, um, as I got pulled out more and more, things started changing. Um, you should get into video, they said. And I was like, <laughs> no, nah, I've got my systems. I'm doing this the way I want to do it. I'll be fine. And I don't really like being in front of a camera. So it was easy for me to push back and say, hey, no, Google loves me, sends me lots of traffic. I, I'm not even going to bother with that. And so I, I really did evolve. And I would say, from COVID forward, that really, I mean, that knocked me out because not only was I already kind of heading in a, a negative direction slowly, like not fast enough to be worried about it uh, with my business. But um, during that time, I, I think everybody handled that differently in terms of it was an opportunity, uh, a, lot of, a lot of cases to, <clears throat> uh, because everybody was trying to get online and okay, I, you know, sell these products to help people get online. I think it was because I, I still tra track it back to the, an email I sent out to my entire list. I don't even remind, I, th I think it's just because that's, that's right, right when it started hitting in the US, but we we're starting to hear stories about Italy and whatnot. And, you know, I was, I was in this, this period of time, we we're trying to figure out if our baseball team was gonna travel to Arizona for a, a tournament. <laughs> So it's kind of talking about that and asking how, everybody how they're doing basically. Cause I know it's like, this sounds like this thing might be kind of a big deal. And then I get flooded with all these emails, mainly from Italy of like, dude, do not, I mean, please take this, this seriously. This is a big deal. People are dying. Don't go in that tournament. You don't need to do it. You know, that kind of thing. I was like, oh, right. crap. So I think this, the seriousness of what was happening hit me at that point. And then, you know, with all the lockdown and everything, it's just, it was a, a mentally, I think I handled it poorly. Um, I couldn't, I'm not, I'm not a natural salesperson in the first place. So now you're like, oh, you got an opportunity here to sell people who are losing their jobs and their businesses are struggling. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to take anybody's money right now. Right. It's, it's kind of the way I, I felt. And so first of all, like all my plans for that year were pretty much wiped out. Like this doesn't even feel right doing whatever this topic was I was going to talk about. I ended up creating some super cheap product so I could keep making money. There was just, there wasn't even Facebook ads really. It was like, you know, how do you get online kind of stuff. Right. But it was, right. it was way less expensive than anything I, I normally, and I was just trying to do my part while also like not gouging people. And you know, it's from that point forward is I was struggling and I wasn't getting on video. Um, and you know, that right around that time, it's probably, you know, TikTok, you know, Instagram, Instagram videos probably starting to take off and I was not getting involved. So I think it's all, it was all t kind of timed out right in that oof, I was hitting a, a make or break point um, this summer. Uh, final season, baseball season coaching comes to an end. And then I'm like, okay, I've got all the time in the world. It's now I can start doing this. video. <laughs> And it, it, I'm telling you, man, it's not easy. Uh, it's so it's from, from the out from someone who's doing it. It's always easy to say, oh yeah, just create video. It's fine. It, you, you'll, you'll get a hang of it. It's hard at first. Get... I get it for anyone who just like, it just can't do it. Like you look, especially you just, just open the TikTok app, create, create a video. And like, there's so many options Yeah. just within <laughs> that editing thing. Like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And, um, but truthfully, you know, it was a moment once I commit, cause it was a period of time. Like I was making fun of TikTok, and then a week later I was, you were on videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. 
and, and that making fun of it was largely just kind of fear of it and also knowing like, I probably need to do it. But, um, but basically there was a, a point in time where like, number one, I admitted to myself, this is going to suck. I'm going to create some really bad videos. Well, you've said that in your videos, like right. I'm shooting it, this and I know this sucks, but I've got to start somewhere. <laughs> that video you're speaking of comes off as like satire. Where I'm trying to make it look like it sucks but I was really trying to make that look good. <laughs> so that was one of my questions is your early videos were not good and, and they've evolved and they're really good now. If you're not following John on TikTok or Facebook or whatever, I highly, highly recommend. But um, the videos you do now are great. But I, I appreciate that. Ago, they were not. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, some of the videos I did like before that weren't made for TikTok. It was just like, I made a video for something or I don't even remember what it was. And like, I tried to make it the right dimensions. I cropped it or whatever and I threw it on TikTok. I wasn't right. like using it. Right, right. Um, but it was that moment where I did that one, this is gonna suck and that's okay. But the, the point of it was, yeah, like no one's watching this, uh, first of all. Second of all, I have a purpose right now. Like I know I can't just automatically go out there and start creating good videos. Right. And I can't worry about it. Right. Like I just got to create something, learn from it. And, and that, that's really what happened is like, I started creating videos and like connecting with people and like asking questions, like, how did you do this? How did you do that? And like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Editing is a lifesaver, by the way. <laughs> like if you could just like cut out, like I ramble. Which by I, the way, we're not doing in this. So right, right, right. this will be in this podcast. I apologize, but that's just how it's going to work. <laughs> well, that, but that's the struggle for me. Uh, with something that it's, you're supposed to be short, you're like get to the point and really under a minute, because if you want to push it to uh, Instagram and Facebook, it's, I mean, Facebook's got to be under a minute for a, a reel. And so it's like learning that, oh, like initially what I did, you might even saw, I, I'd sit down and record something, it ended up being like six parts. Right. Like it was right. like, I, I, okay, I cut it, cut it up that way. But then it's like, no, I don't need to do it that way. Like I'm going to sit down talk about something for three or four minutes and there's gonna be parts of here that's just aren't that important and i'm gonna cut out all the pauses and it's gonna be 60 seconds and so having that in my mind always when i'm recording has really helped me because i do ramble i'm slow to the point <laughs> um but so, so it's like you know the the, it's, the tiktok stuff has been really helpful you know kind of a new adventure but what's so valuable about it, it's not just the TikTok side of it. It's like, I've created a format now that can be used in so many places. So I, I, I upload the same video, not, not the watermark version, but the same video to Instagram reels, to Facebook reels, to YouTube shorts. I create a version on a square canvas for LinkedIn. And for the ones that don't do screen sharing, I take the video or the audio out of it and plop it into a template where I have for my podcast, where I do my, my podcast shots. So, so quick versions like, oh, that's per perfect. Just a quick one, one minute, talk about a topic. So it's like, now it's everywhere. And so I'm glad I you mean, bring this up because this yeah. is exactly what we do. And cool. I think we got it from you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got, I got kind of a funny story for you. So you're gonna laugh at this. So I was yeah, in yeah. political consulting before. And after 2016, I was like, I'm out of this. And it was mostly local stuff, county, mm -hmm. school board, stuff like that. And I had an artist that had the, the office next to me. And you may recognize his name. His name's Tom LaBaff. Yeah. And he says, hey, um, I'm doing this thing called Sketch Brawl. And I'm working with this guy, John Loomer. Never heard of you. And he says, and he's helping me a lot with this. So I started going in there and helping him with things here and there with Facebook. Because I had learned, like you, how to use Facebook through my previous job. Political consulting. We were doing a lot yeah, of Facebook. Yeah, yeah. You were doing it with the NBA. And I started following your stuff. And I was like... Yeah, I could do this in Vero, where I live, Vero Beach, Florida, and this would work. And so it's so right. funny that like everything that you're saying you do, I'm pretty sure we've just stolen from you and tried to replicate <laughs> it in a local area. Well, but, I've been um, doing it. Anyway, it? so yeah, keep going. <laughs> I, I've been doing it for like two months, you know, so like don't steal much from me because I'm, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, but yeah, but it is th that value of that isn't just the fact that TikTok Because like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of building a new audience there, which is good. And I still have goals there because like, I just think there's a need that hasn't been met in terms of Facebook ads education on TikTok that, that, you know, I can fill that void. But regardless, man, there, like I built up an audience of like close to 200,000 people on Facebook and like, I barely use it anymore. It also like 
because I've been stuck on only sharing links, I just don't reach reach as many people or as make. I mean, I, I think I'm spoiled too because like I'll still drive like 50 to 100 people to my website with each with each link I share, but it's just like I don't know. I just got gotten out of that routine. I started sharing these reels. First of all, I haven't used Instagram at all. Like, I initially set it up as a personal account. Eventually converted it over to business connected, and I've really only used it as a placement for my ads because I, I just I haven't used it. Because again, photos, videos, not doing not that. your thing. Yeah, was well, not my <laughs> thing. So, so two things happened. Um, so yeah, in addition to just uh, using TikTok and that was good. Facebook, this was a daily uh, feedback I was getting from people. John, and you know, this is this is like the. Uh, I'm not gonna say backhanded compliment, but it's like one of those where it's like, oh, thanks. Oh, it makes me feel like crap. Uh, John, you helped me so much back in like 2014. <laughs> I feel feel old, whatever. Uh, haven't seen you in years. It's good to see you here. It was that kind of thing where repeatedly people were now seeing me again because I was okay. I, I'll buy into this this game, right? We got we got to use video if we want to be seen again. And, but it's, it's not just that I was playing that game. It's like, you show a different side of yourself that you can't show with a link thumbnail and all that kind of stuff. And then Instagram, I've been getting, you know, I've had nothing on Instagram. And so now getting, you know, uh, feedback and, you know, correspondence with people there. But, you know, I think part of this for me too, and, and I feel like I'm jumping all over, so feel free to- No, you're you know. good, man. Keep, I'm loving this. <laughs> so one, one of the videos I did recently, is a lot about you know what kept me from doing this and first of all was yeah the just the uncomfortableness of being in front of a video and just all the technology behind it and backstage all that stuff but it was also a matter of my business has always been built around driving traffic to my website and google loves me yes i want and so i want i want to get more traffic i want to build my email list because my email list sells etc 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 and videos um especially if your video is only intended to educate and you don't do any ctas um and on TikTok, good luck uh, driving traffic with with a video um it, it's just you're and first of all, if you ever like start pushing ctas on TikTok, it's also it stands out in a negative way that's a sad point the point was i need i needed to look at it differently like is there still value in creating these videos if I'm not ultimately measuring a business goal? Like how much traffic came from that? Because the, the question immediately became, what's the ROI of this? Like, I, I don't know. Like, right. I'm not even I'm not even trying to sell the ads I've run so far. I'm not even trying to drive people to my website. Um, I, I couldn't tell you. And then it, finally, though, I started to see the payoff for that over a period of two or three days, no joke, there were four people who set up one-on-ones and told me, I am here because I saw your videos. And th these were also almost pretty consistently people who were those who said they followed me religiously back in, you know, eight, five to eight years ago. Maybe they even bought something from me way back then, kind of fell off my list and now they're back. Um, so I can't really measure that. I only know it if you tell me that, but I have heard that similar story so many times since I started this. So that was my question to you, or was going to be my question to you is what value have you seen with this transition into TikTok? And it sounds like people are finding you again. Do you think there's a value for people that never knew who you were that are now seeing you for the first time? Absolutely. Yeah. I see both sides, right? So Number one, yes, it's the, the matter of actually reaching people again, certainly important. But there's also just the matter of the personal connection that you make with a video. Um, so people, this, this could be new people as well, because a lot of the older people, they already kind of knew me um, through my story and whatnot, a lot, whether it's podcasting or whatever. Uh, but this is a way to kind of introduce me personally to a, a newer audience and yeah I'll, I'll, there was someone who signed up the other day she's like i signed up because like i feel like i know you now and that's the powerful thing right about video especially if you're creating a lot of it 
and I've been trying to create a lot of it and try to be all over the place and having a podcast. I mean, <laughs> those things, I mean, it's, it's, it's such, it's kind of anti-traditional marketing in a way, but on the other hand, it's almost like billboards and stuff, you know, it's like, you can't really measure it, but you know, it works. You know. So what is your exact answer to somebody when they say, Hey, I'm going to hire you for a one-on-one and I'm going to run <laughs> Facebook ads. What can I expect my ROI to be? What do you tell them? Because I can tell you what we tell clients, but I want to hear what you say. Oh, what, that, what can I expect the ROI of my Facebook ads to be? Right. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> that is the exact thing that we okay. say. Two words. It depends. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it depends. It's, it feels like a cop out. I've, I've like written about it and talked about it before. Like, that's my answer for so many things because, as you know, there's, there's so much that sets you up for success or failure with ads, with marketing, with whatever. I mean, there's so many things that are in your control, so many things that you can, all these levers that you can change and whatnot uh, from copy and creative and your targeting and your optimization, all kinds of stuff. There's so much that's outside of your control, you know? So what's the industry? Is, is your product any good? Um, you know, what kind of competition do you have? Do people even know who you are in the first place? Do you have a built-in audience that you can target that they're gonna be ready to buy? Like all this stuff um that's both inside and outside of your control so like what can you expect i mean it depends, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> so the next question i get is well then what's it gonna cost and to give you the answer before the question it depends, yeah, it depends. It, is that yeah. the same answer you give <laughs> well yeah because like if i really have no idea like you, you can look at some benchmarks um related to your industry and um as a starting point, but like, like a one-on-one -on -one session in 45 minutes, like, and I'm not, I'm not a great, uh, ad creative and messaging guy. I'm all about the tools and knowing how everything works. Right? right. So don't listen to me in terms of like, Oh, that's a good looking ad. Like it could be, maybe it's not. Right. Uh, but there's just so much with the, with the copy and the creative and okay. Now you send them to your website. Uh, does the website work you right. know, how, how does a website do it at actually selling this thing how what's your budget because if you're if you're looking to spend 10 bucks 50 bucks a day and you've got a 500 product you're not selling that thing on facebook i mean right. you should try to do something else like maybe build your list build awareness of your brand things like that but you need to have really realistic expectations that that budget is not gonna like all of a sudden like oh my god what i can't believe we weren't running ads before look at all these these sales we've got it's not magical um, we we have this conversation all the time. I turn so many clients away because of yeah. what you just said. Somebody says, "Oh, I want to spend two grand a month, and I have a five thousand dollars machine. I want to sell." That's right. like, what? <laughs> what are we doing here? You yeah. know, like this is not the way. Well, I, I see my competitors doing it, and I want to do it. I'm like, listen, if you just want to get seen by your competitors, we can do it for way less than yeah. grand. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, and it, I think it's just all about you know realistic expectations, right? It's not that advertising isn't worthwhile for that two two grand a month if you want to do it um, with an expensive product. You just have to understand, I may not see immediate sales as a result of this. There might be that that one lead that happens, right? That turns into a sale and all of a sudden it's it's worthwhile uh, for that two grand because I've got an expensive product. Right. But um, yeah, I think too, too often people expect to hop in there and it's it's magical and it's easy and yeah why weren't we doing it because we're gonna make a whole bunch of money so and, one and it's hard to track track it these days too with reporting so oh yeah well i mean ios 14 and all that stuff i mean you have uh, run some videos recently talking about how facebook has released i guess some more some better data and some better analytics for us um yeah. which is great and and now we're starting to, to to get tools back that we haven't had in a while and again that's much appreciated but there's still a lot of stuff there that i think we're missing um, but it, one question yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, we just started kind of a management division and, and I'll give you some background on this. When we first started our company, it was all ads. It was just ads. We're, we were like you, mm. like I have the tools and the capability and the knowledge on how to place these. And that's what we're going to do. And then people would say, well, what does the ad look like? So then of course we had to go hire yeah. people that were creative and could shoot video and photos and stuff like that. And then it was all right, well, we've got really good looking ads and we know that we're hitting the right people, but what's my website look like? So again, it's, um, we're hiring people to develop uh, websites and build web pages, so on and so forth. 
Now we've started introducing a management division to our company, which we'd never done before. Mm. And I guess my question to you is, is there real value in running ads if you are not actively posting to your pages? It depends. It depends. Uh, <laughs> hey, so we title every podcast and I know <laughs> right now the title of this podcast. <laughs> Look, um, I, depending on the the business and the industry, like there may be very little value in posting organically. Like it, who wants to hear from, I'm, I'm not going to label any type. Well, of we have a payroll company brand. that I always use as the example yeah. and we share an office with him and he's one of my best friends. So I always say, who wants to hear from payroll companies? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So I, I wouldn't even bother unless you've got some time on your hands and you know, and who knows, maybe you'll find great success that I wasn't expecting. I think far, far too often too, what people try to do in that, that kind of case, I don't know if they hire someone to do this or what, but they just take templated content that's supposed to be popular and viral that has nothing to do with their brand or industry whatsoever. And I feel like that's a waste of time too. Um, so, and like, you know, even like e -com in some cases, like you might not need to, right? Like you can run run ads that are based on your catalog and whatnot. I mean, I think it's, it's best if you can run or, organic posts as well. I think like your, your typical like mom and pop uh, restaurant, things like where you can like showcase, you know, what's our special of the day and you know, all this kind of, you know, behind the scenes. I think that yeah, stuff's valuable if you've got the resources to do it. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, I think ultimately try it out. <laughs> try like, do you have enough content, enough ideas to constantly, you know, create content is there a demand for it? Are you getting engagement on it? Um, is it, are you seeing any type of impact? You know, like has anyone ever said, oh, they saw this post and that's why they, they bought, or that's why they're here in your store or whatever it is. I mean, those are all things you have to kind of sort out and measure. And because a lot of these small businesses don't have the resources to do it. And that's, so that's if you point. don't, if you don't have the resources, if you don't have the content, if you don't have the ideas or the time or the X, Y, and Z, but you hire someone to run ads for that business, you say yeah. that there could be value in just the yeah. ads alone. Oh yeah, oh yeah, gotcha. absolutely. Because because then you have a very focused goal and intention. Yeah, you know, with those ads, you can hopefully reach the right people through through the optimization. Um, but yeah, no, it, it can absolutely work that way. Gotcha. Um, let's see. I've got a few more here. Um, B2B. How yeah. much business to business do you do? I mean, look, I mean, for me, I, I kind of consider what I do B2B. I mean, right. I, I'm, I'm working, um, with, with other, with other brands, with marketing departments, consultants, whatever. Um, so that's, that's pretty much my biz. So you know, it's, I think that B2B generally on Facebook, you know, can work. Um, I think, you know, LinkedIn is probably ideal for B2B. There was my, um, there was my question. You, uh, you, you got to it before I asked it, but keep going. <laughs> yeah. Look, Facebook has its strengths and weaknesses. I think um, the problem with Facebook, like there are things that LinkedIn does better than Facebook. First of all, B2B. Google does better than Facebook. It's like, especially for those service companies that like they don't really make a lot of sense creating organic content for on Facebook, that, that kind of situation or running ads is really hard for like you're a plumber. How on Facebook are you going to reach people? I, I use plumber all the time. How are you going to reach people who need a plumber? Right? It, you can't really, right. but on Google you can't because right. people are searching, you know, looking, looking for that solution. <laughs> So it's all a matter of like understanding what Facebook strengths and weaknesses are, because you can still, you know, leverage that other effort, you know, that you're doing on LinkedIn or you're doing on Google um, with your Facebook ads. But uh, yeah, you have to understand where it works and where it doesn't. So the analogy that I always use when I'm talking to a, a potential client is a hey, pretend this is 1985. Um, Facebook is the billboard. It's the uh, newspaper ad. Um, it may even be the radio ad that you hear and Google is the yellow pages. Would you say that that's a, an accurate analogy? I think so. 
I is there a way so. to make that analogy better <laughs> i don't know about that uh okay. <laughs> yeah no, I'm, no i don't know but i don't have a good analogy i say so um, where we live and people like, are gonna go yeah. ahead well i was gonna say where we live uh, we, we live in a, uh, we, we say that we're always behind the times here. I, I just told a story uh, yesterday about how our, our um, county was founded in 1926. Okay, so we're almost at 100 years. And, and, and we were a part of another county. And the reason why we split is because we had a, a theater that ran picture shows on Sundays. And that was against the law in the <laughs> county that we were currently in. So they wanted to create a new county where you could run picture shows on Sundays. The sheriff rode his horse from this town to the south of us up here to shut down the movie theater oh. and i was like there were 20 million cars in circulation in 1926 but where we live we are always behind the times so yeah. we joke because we feel like we can look into a crystal ball and see what's going to happen in the future because what's happening in bigger cities and what's happening with bigger agencies will happen here and we could be on the forefront of all of that um so I guess I, I kind of forget where I was going with that story. No, 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 it's fine. Well, because <laughs> I live in an older community where, you know, we can kind of predict the future here. Um, so what we're trying to do is is not be too far ahead of the curve, but we got to be ahead of it. Right. Um, but anyway, I, like I said, I've got a, a few more questions here for you. Um, yeah. So with B2B, are you seeing your short form videos uh as being effective on TikTok for your b2b advertising for lack of better terms yeah um i wouldn't say it's it's not as obvious to me as the, the facebook and instagram stuff um, but once again I'm, I'm creating a whole new brand from scratch on TikTok, so that, that's the difference there and i do, you know i do get feedback from people I, I think the issue with TikTok too is like not everybody's on that platform. So an example would be like I when you upload an email list uh, for Facebook for to use for targeting, mm -hmm. generally you expect I don't know fifty percent or so of those people to be matched up with Facebook profiles for, for your remarketing, right? Um, with and, and maybe more than that with all the different columns of data you can provide. With TikTok, it it was. 10%. Yeah, it was 10%. So that that has there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, just their method of being able to up upload customer lists is like from 10 years ago, Facebook, but because <laughs> uh, really all you because all I'm and I'm in a test in a test uh, right now where you can't even upload email addresses and phone numbers unless you're part of this test. Gotcha. And so remember, remember the old days of Facebook where you only uploaded a file of email addresses. Right. Well, now you have like 14 indicators. Yeah, right, exactly. So TikTok's only that one column of data. So that, that hurts. But, you know, not everybody's on TikTok. Uh, and it could be because you're you can't because of the country you're in as well. So, you know, 10 percent, um, you know, I'm, these are completely new people I'm reaching, basically. So um, I. It's, it's tougher to measure there for me. Um, whereas I know Facebook, Instagram, it's, it's funny because like the, the engagement on Instagram and TikTok, cause they're the exact same audience sizes now, which is funny. You know, I, I just started TikTok from scratch. The Instagram one I've had for years, but I haven't used it. Right. And, and so they're the same size. So I could, I did a comparison recently and, the, and it's really hard to measure, right? It's just all surface level stuff. I get slightly better engagement from TikTok whether that leads to sales and whatnot, I couldn't tell you for sure. Cause I don't even know where people are watching these when they tell me they're signing up. I should probably ask them that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a, a few guys on staff here. And, and so I went to them and I told them that we were doing this podcast with you. And of course, you know, we're an advertising agency. So this is a great op opportunity to ask yeah. a guy that knows what he's talking about these questions. One question we got from a guy was, um, and, and I know that this is a very generalized question, but how long should you run an ad on Facebook before changing it up? You know, the answer is going to be, it depends. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> well, it really, it, it really just comes down to one thing. I mean, follow the metrics. So, um, I think the the thing that people are most concerned about is like audience saturation and frequency. And so that impacts the, the performance of your ad. Um, so there's actually a tool depending on the optimization. If you select an ad set and you click on the, uh, uh, inspect tool, that little magnifying glass in the far right, 
you have a bunch of data there for things like audience saturation and frequency and reach and first time impression ratio. And there are charts that compare that. You can have it compare that to your cost per conversion. So like if those things are going in a negative direction and your cost per conversion is going up along with it, that tells you, yeah, maybe you should switch things up. But if your cost per conversion staying flat, if all these things aren't really spiking, you're fine. I mean, at the end of the day, only one thing matters. You know, what, what's your cost, your CPA, what's your cost per action? The thing that you, that you want most. Um, there's no definite like amount of time. I mean, the first thing I'd always say now, especially like the last few years, at least let it get, get through the week. Um, we need it to learn because your, your results won't be stable during the, that first week as Facebook going through that learning phase and, um, you're bound to get your best results. And this is really more of a last few years thing. Cause I, I swear it used to be your best results are going to be in those first few days. Right. But um, you got to let I it get through the learning phase. Yeah. But but that's yeah. Now these days it's like, yeah, you got to get through that learning phase and then you might see your best results uh, because Facebook's applying what they learned. And then it's a matter of, you know, is your audience big enough? Um, is your or how big is your budget um, to the point where you're going to start seeing really increased frequencies and audience saturation. So um, really the factors being budget and audience size that really contribute to that kind of decision. So there's your answer, Dilly. Depends. <laughs> depends. Um, uh, so Facebook will tell us when we have creative fatigue. Um, yeah. Is it just using those metrics and those factors that you just brought up to, is there a threshold that it hits? And once it hits, Facebook I have no says, idea. Okay. But you trust yeah. Facebook when it says that, or do you trust and then verify? Or you nah, don't even look nah. at it? Nah. I, was, I, I rarely even see that. <laughs> um, I think partly because I don't normally look on the ad level, right? And that's where you got to see it. Right. I'm, right. I'm usually on the campaign or ad set level. Right. Um, and then everything else, I just like let it ride, I guess. I don't know. But um, once again, like they might say there's creative fatigue. And I, I would assume that would indicate the results are are, are bad at this point or going in a negative direction. Uh, but yeah, you got to verify that first. Gotcha. So it's kind of like gotcha. like with learn, learning limit, limited as an example. Yep. Um, you want to get through the learning phase if you can. But if you can't get enough conversions, for Facebook to get through the learning phase and you get that learning limited message, that doesn't mean stop. Right, right. What's your what's your CPA? If your CPA right. is acceptable, who cares? Yeah, write it out. Um, another question we had from somebody in the office is, do you see more value in high quality video versus, and we quoted this, shitty Android video? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's tough to say. Like, I, I know, like the whole, I, I see a lot of people say, you know, just something casual is better than highly produced, right? Um, I think there's something in between because when I see a video that pops up where it's unedited, bad lighting, bad audio, they take a long time to say anything, I'm out of there, right? They don't have, they don't have any captioning, you know, anything like that. Um, so yeah, I don't think you need to have like professional photography, professional videographers and whatnot, uh, actors and like all this kind of stuff. Um, but lighting's important having, you know, when I say high quality video, you know, I use my phone, right? right. Um, have a decent mic. I mean, my blue Yeti has kind of seen the end of its days. Like, I, I need to, I, I've decided <laughs> I, I need to upgrade because it's, it was good for the last 10 years. It's about time to move up to something else. Um, and I'm seeing that with these videos. It's like I, I watched someone else's video, like, damn, that sounds really good. That sounds right. better than mine. So um, it's something in between. Like, you can't, now I, you create, create your crappy video to get started. Right. Um, but I think you'll quickly realize what, what does well, but also what you uh, engage with the most and what you really like is going to be something that is well edited and has some good lighting and good, good audio. So it sounds like you're saying the content is more important than the creative when it comes to well, the okay. platforms. Well, the content is absolutely important. Right. <laughs> um, 
but th- this is such a science though too yeah um so how you how do you get to that content because you can have a great message but if you take forever to get to it right they're never gonna watch it right right um and like it's all about presentation i figured that out too like and i'm still like i've got a lot to learn but that i know that first five seconds or so you've got to explain what they're about to get that's the, the hook they say sure um to, to keep them watching otherwise you may have a great message at the end but no one's gonna get to it gotcha so what we've learned is that TikTok rewards the more organic look and it seems this way and yeah. instagram rewards the more higher quality look why if that's true i don't know why that is i don't know um but it just seems to, to be that way. So well, and like, I don't know what, what is an organic look. What is an organic look right, these days? I, I don't right. even know. That's a good. That's a very good point. Um, now, yeah, right now that you know cameras on phones are starting to get better and better. You're right. What well, what does organic uh, look like? Um, yeah. I've gone through the questions I have on paper, but I I do want to ask you. You work for the NBA. Who's your team? Oh, the, I, so I'm I'm a Wisconsin boy originally. So, All right. I'm, so I'm, Bucks. A, I'm a Bucks fan. Yeah. Okay. So it's funny. You're in Denver, near Denver. Um, my son, my middle, my middle child is a huge uh, Nuggets fan. Oh, and, nice. and he asked me last night, I was like, oh yeah, I got this podcast tomorrow with this guy in Colorado. He's like, oh, is, do you like the Nuggets? I'm like, I don't know. I'll ask him. I'll... <laughs> so I did not. So uh, it's an interesting situation with my family. So I have three boys. My wife's from Colorado. So she, it's been a bit of a battle uh, in the in the sports. It was it was now this was established relatively early though with the boys. They were all Brewers fans. Okay. Um, but they're all Broncos fans, which is unfortunate. Yeah, uh, this year for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, even the Packers. Yeah, but uh, and then when it comes to the NBA, I think it's because my youngest one grew up when the Bucks have been good. Right. Uh, so he's he's been more of a Bucks fan. I wouldn't say he's like a super loyal Bucks fan. My other other two would be Nuggets fans. It, we're just a, kind of a, a mess, I guess. So and and I know we're just getting off on a wild tangent yeah. now, but I have two boys, baseball players. I coach. It's so funny because mm-hmm. like everything that you're talking about is like, yep, this is my life. Um, yeah. But my oldest son has followed me with. So I'm a big Dodgers fan. Um, my mm-hmm. oldest son's a Dodger fan. My other son is an Astros fan, and he started rooting for them oh, before man. they even went, won the World Series. So that's really unfortunate. The Astros yeah. fan is is uh, also a huge Steelers fan. Again, I can't figure out the the connection there. Um, my oldest son is a Seahawks fan, and like it's just wild how kids now just root for anybody and everybody. I guess it makes a little bit more sense your kids having the Wisconsin to Colorado connection, but mine are just everywhere. I mean, we've never been yeah. to Colorado. Why is he a Nuggets fan? Yeah. <laughs> Nikola Jokic, I guess. But <laughs> no, I don't. Well, Florida, right? Yeah. Yep. So, here's the problem with Florida. This is from an outside perspective. Okay. Like yeah, I, baby... we got it. This is going to be the most important part of this podcast, by the way. <laughs> Whoever's listening or watching, listen up. I mean, those baseball teams. They suck. I mean, well, not the Rays. The Rays made the World Series a couple years ago. It's not even that they suck. Like the Marlins won a couple of World Series, right? It's just that like. I don't know. I don't know if it's the marketing. Uh, there's no loyalty with those Marlins teams. And really, even the Rays, like, they, they do a good job of developing teams and they ship them off. Uh, but, yeah, you don't really have, like, this raging fan base, right? So the argument that we hear down here, again, we we are 140 miles north of Miami, and we are on the exact opposite side of the state from Tampa. As a matter of fact, you take one road from my house to the Ray Stadium. Uh, it's directly mm-hmm. across the state. Um, the argument that we hear is, people that live here are not from here so like you you're a brewers fan but you're in colorado Mm -hmm. most people from wisconsin if they're going to move out of the state they probably move to florida people from new york move to florida people from pennsylvania move to florida people from all these other places move here and they already have a team so unless you're born and raised here which there are very few of us uh you're not gonna like the team that's here (laughs) and that's the argument that we get and then they say well that's why attendance is low and why you know like the rays say well we don't have any attendance because so we have to sell it you know trade everybody it's like well if you kept guys maybe you'd get attendance it's the the chicken or the egg um but uh yeah i had to ask you you're a big sports fan i'm a huge sports fan so i had to ask about uh you know who your nba team was but (laughs) yeah no and i i think that's kind of similar with the rockies fan base here um but you know i think when they're good they're they're pretty good pretty pretty good fan base out here but yeah the people from all over out here in colorado as well but yeah bucks man bucks all day um yeah 
We'll see. We'll see if they could do it again this year. It's, they're good. It's where are they right? Where, where are they in the standings right now? I, know it's I, I think they're second overall yeah. in the East. Yep. Uh, so Boston, I think, is ahead of them right now. Yeah. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, Phoenix out west is looking really good. But I think Boston's Boston's got to be the best team in the league right now, right? I mean, it, it appears that way. <laughs> Look, any season where the Lakers and the Warriors aren't down. Dom- Dominating is a good season. So well, the Warriors aren't dominating. I think they're holding like that last playoff spot right now. In the yeah, West, and like but, even uh, the Lakers are winning right now. But right. like for I, I was really like I, I enjoy watching teams I don't like lose. So like when uh, the yeah, Warriors I'm the same way. Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> so when the Warriors and Lakers were losing constantly those first few weeks, that was a lot of fun. And the and the Bucks were winning every game. It was great. Yeah, I know everybody. Everybody cares about this. But, you know. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I do, <laughs> and that's all that matters. No, my mom listens to this, and that's about it. So, uh, yeah. So it doesn't really matter at this point. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that was it. I love the James Brown uh, poster yeah. in the back there as well. I gotta, uh, yeah, I gotta figure out how to get one of those. That's that's. You like that, Dilly? Dilly's a big music fan. But uh, nice. Yeah, man. Well, I mean, that those are all the questions I had here. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. I think this is about the end of the podcast. So, if you got anything you want to add. Say it now. I don't think so. I don't think so. Thanks. Thanks so, so much for having me, though. I know this is a, a different format for you, so I appreciate. Yeah, we it. we definitely. Uh, this is not how we normally do it. Um, yeah. but it's cool because we've I think learned some some ways to maybe start doing this more in the future. But uh, I really really can't thank you enough for coming on. I've been talking about this for since we booked it. Um, I'm super stoked to have you on, man. And uh, yeah, thank you. I just can't thank you enough. Anytime, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. All right.